Good afternoon. Um, so welcome to American University Washington College of Law. On behalf of the program on information justice and intellectual property, I want to thank everyone who's here with us live at, at, at AU and who's with us on the internet either live or watching us at a later date. Um, as many people know, we are gathered here today to discuss the case of ABC Inc. versus Aereo Inc. Um, and uh, uh, said by some to be about the future of television. Maybe yes, maybe no. Uh, we'll find out more today. Um, but this is part of our regular series of, of events in which at any case that the Supreme Court takes involving an intellectual property issue, we invite counsel for the parties and uh, Michi and other commentators to join us to learn more about the, the details of the case and then also to discuss the what you can glean from the oral argument, recognizing that often you cannot take uh, too much uh, away from the oral argument uh, because questions are asked sometimes hypothetically. Um, so in, in order to sort of set up the case, um, I, I want to do a couple of uh, quick background and invite the panelists to enlarge upon any of these points um, uh, that they think may enter into the justice's um, uh, consideration of the case. I also want to say that we have a number of students in the room. Uh, this is, in fact, my IP and cyberspace last class. Thank you, class, for being here. Uh, but I would also ask the panelists that uh, when the, if the discussion gets too far into inside baseball where assumptions are, are, are being made about uh, knowledge of the depths of the statute, I may ask you to uh, bring, you know, come up for air for a minute and, and make sure we're all included in the conversation and including the folks on the web. Because there are definitely some technical uh, details uh, in both the statutory issues and in terms of the technology that are relevant to the resolution of this case. Um, and however it comes out, as a law teacher, I will say that this is a fantastic teaching case because the the question is a, a question of statutory interpretation, and it raises the issue of how judges make statutory interpretation decisions. What do they pay attention to? The intent of Congress, of course, is is paramount, but when the intent does not dictate a result, how does one find their way to a result and how much attention is paid to the consequences of a particular interpretation as opposed to the history either the and the business setting in which this uh, is being uh, taken. So let's talk first a little bit about the technology. I'm going to show a video that will give you a sense of, of well, what Aereo's business is that sets up the problem that, uh, that the court must resolve. A New York-based startup called Aereo just launched its streaming TV service here in New York, so we decided to give it a test drive. The company, which is backed by former TV executive Barry Diller, expects to roll out the service to up to 100 cities within a year. Basically, Aereo lets you stream and record all of the stations that are available free over the air. Right now, the Aereo service, which is $12 a month, only works on the Safari browser and iPhone and iPads but the company expects to roll it up to other browsers and Android devices sometime soon. So let's take a look at it on my iPad. On an iPhone or iPad or on your computer, you just go to the Safari browser and log into Arreo.com. You can register up to five devices on an account, and it's actually very easy to get started. So what's interesting about the Arreo interface is that it's very app-like, even though it exists in a browser. The site, which is built on HTML5, is much easier to navigate on a touchscreen device using your finger than on a computer using a mouse. So it's really straightforward. There's a guide that displays the shows that are currently on air and those coming up. And you can just tap on a show to watch it or record it. So let's take a look at Arthur, which is currently on PBS. There's a little bar on the video player that shows the streaming status. Uh, this little dot, once it gets all the way to the right, where the, the live, that's where it might pause for a couple seconds and buffer. But really, it's been very, very reliable every time that we've tried to watch a show. On the area site, you can easily change your five registered devices and also check on the status of your two antennas. Each area account has two dedicated antennas, which are tiny, wafer-thin little guys that live in a warehouse in Brooklyn. Having two antennas allows you to watch live TV at the same time that you may be recording something. To watch your recorded shows, you just go up to your recordings and click on what you want to watch. I recently recorded a local newscast. Click watch, and I'll show up. Right now, every major broadcaster in New York is suing Ariel for copyright infringement. 
The lawsuits basically imply that Aereo is somehow stealing from the conventional way of watching TV. Well, you can certainly watch Aereo on your TV using Apple TV or a Roku box or just plugging it into a computer. And I'm going to stop that since we're going to talk about what the lawsuit's about, and we don't we don't need um, the journalist to tell us that. Um, um, let let me then also say so the statutory question that the court took certiorari on is whether Aereo or whether a company violates the public performance right of the copyright owners um, by, by by doing what Aereo is doing, and so. The copyright owners get a bundle of rights. Um, broadcast television, broadcasters are a mixed uh, hybrid entity. They are content originators of news programming and other programming in which they own the copyrights. And then they are licensees of copyright owners. Um, uh, and that license that they receive is a license to publicly perform, for instance, NFL programming or, or um, you know, the voice or something like that, which is originated by, by an independent producer. Um, and so the question then is, is, is if the broadcaster is publicly performing the works by sending it out to the world, does Aereo make a new public performance when it captures those signals with those little antennas and then streams them over the internet to individual devices? Um, and each of the each of the streams is being generated by an individual copy made by an individual user, and how much that counts is a critical. How much that fact counts is a critical question in the case. That fact has to be mapped to this law. So the the statute defines what it means to perform a, a work publicly, and if you can see on the screen, subsection two of the definition says, to transmit or otherwise communicate a performance or display of the work to a place specified by Clause 1 or to the public, and those words to the public are essential in the, in the argument, uh, by means of any device or process, whether the members of the public capable of receiving the performance or display receive it in the same place or in separate places and at the same time or different times. Um, and the, the immediate background of this case is the Second Circuit had heard an earlier case involving a cable company that created individualized DVRs that allowed consumers to record uh, television programming on those DVRs at the cable system's head end, and then uh, they could push play and stream the signal to the individual consumer. In that case, the Supreme, I'm sorry, the Second Circuit held that uh, the right of making the copy, the person doing the reproducing, was the consumer when they pushed record. But when they pushed play, the court assumed that it was Cablevision that was transmitting and therefore performing the work, but held that that was a private performance. It was not uh, performing the work publicly because the audience for that transmission, according to the Second Circuit, was the audience for this transmission coming from the particular copy of the work, which was an audience of one household. Aereo, relying on that interpretation of the law, set up the model that you just saw with individualized antennas and individualized copies and transmissions uh, to fit within that precedent. And the question is whether there's whether that precedent is good law, and if it is, is it distinguishable from, from this case? Um, the only other piece of, of important background is how did that get in the statute? Why is that the way uh, we define what a public performance is? That's a long history that I, I, we can't spend a lot of time going over. The short version is under the 1909 Act, the Supreme Court had uh, at least four, ca four cases in which uh, they involved a business that was in some way taking over the air signals and then giving them to members of the public. In an early case, it was a hotel taking radio broadcasts, piping it into the room. Court says, that's a new public performance. You need a license. Court seems to forget that uh, precedent in the 1960s. Um, we get a, a, a uh, restaurant that is performing music, a chicken shack basically with a stereo turned on so that customers can hear the music. Um, is that a new public performance? The court says, no, if you're using uh, the same kind of equipment that you could use at home, 
and just turning it on in a restaurant, you're not creating a new public performance and therefore not performing the work publicly. Then comes cable television, originally community access television, where a, an antenna is stuck up on top of a hill, cables are run to the people down in the valley, and the, the, we essentially get the signal streamed to everybody in the valley. But it's one antenna uh, running to everybody. Is that a new public performance? Court says no. Um, but raises the question of maybe Congress should have a look at this, because we're not quite sure. Um, then if, you, if the cable system grows up, starts to alter the content and streams it, does that change the answer? The court says no, it's still the same copyrighted work that was transmitted and therefore performed over the broadcast, uh, through the broadcast medium is simply reaching an extended audience. So there's not a new public performance, but we really think Congress should take a look at this. Congress then does take a look at this and decides that at least for cable systems and then later satellite systems, the retransmission via this transmit clause of that over-the-air programming uh, through a cable system or a satellite broadca uh, broadcasting is a new public performance that requires a copyright license and then the, co the Congress put into the statute a compulsory license for both cable systems and then satellite systems. And so uh, it, it, it was a surprise to some of us who understood that history that Justice Sotomayor's first question at argument today was whether Aereo is not just a cable system. Shouldn't we just stick them in, in the statutory license and be done with it? Um, and we can ask the panelists what they think about the answer to that question. Um, so there's more to be said about that, about the legislative history, about legislative intent. But the trick and the difficulty is this definition of what it means to transmit to the public and whether the, the Second Circuit's interpretation that, if, that, that the public ought to be the public that can receive the transmission coming from an individual copy, that's the Second Circuit's holding, or whether, as the, as the petitioners say, it is the, the audience capable of receiving the work of authorship and, that, and therefore you should aggregate those different streams and under that interpretation, Aereo is clearly performing the work to the public. Um, and that is, the, in a nutshell, the statutory question, the statutory choice the court has to, uh, to face. Um, and how they will do that and, and what they revealed about how they will do that in the argument is what we will now discuss. So I'm going to invite our panelists to join us. We will get the light out of their eyes. Just memorize subsection two. We'll, uh, <laughs> So I think what we'll do is uh, we'll just we'll just run the table here. We'll we'll just go straight down to to my right. Um, let me briefly introduce um, our, our panelists. Um, so uh, Caitlin Hall is counsel um, on the brief for Aereo and was in the courtroom today. Um, and um, uh, next to her is uh, Matt Williams, who is counsel for um, a, a, a number of copyright owning or copyright li uh, license, licensing entities in the, in the music business, ASCAP, RIAA, um, and a series of others who, who filed in support of the petitioners. Um, next to him is uh, Bob Garrett, um, uh, who is counsel for the National Football League and Major League Baseball. Uh, obviously, when you think about live television and what kinds of content um, people most want to watch on live television, professional sports uh, certainly is in that top top five, top ten uh, of the content that, that has that kind of value. Um, next to him is my uh, friend and colleague, Peter Yazzi, who's uh, our, our longtime dean of the copyright bar at Washington College of Law, um, who is also counsel for um, Amicus, the Consumer Federation of America, uh, working with our, our clinic students here at, at, at WCL. And to his right is Mitch Stoltz at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Um, and uh, on behalf of 
yourselves, yes? or uh, That was us and the Consumer Electronics Association and Engine Advocacy and Public Knowledge. Okay, great. And then in, in the interest of full disclosure, I was a co-author um, with Peter and, and um, uh, Sean Flynn and Meredith Jacob here at WCL on an amicus brief uh, dealing with a narrow issue about um, international law and whether the United States international uh, agreements uh, impact the court's sort of choice of statutory interpretation. But I am here as a nonpartisan moderator, but that's, so that's it. And, and I don't think we're going to spend a lot of time on that issue because it got very little attention in the party's briefs and, and almost no attention at argument today. Um, all right, with that uh, brief introduction, Caitlin, why don't you give us your impressions? How do you, how do you think you did? And what, what do you think the justices are, are going to be thinking about when they go back to chambers? Sure. Um, so before doing that, I want to offer a, a brief clarification um, because I think that there's an aspect of Aereo's technology that's important to appreciate, and that is that Aereo's technology works by allowing consumers to make personal recordings of broadcast content and then stream those personal recordings to themselves. So there's never um, live viewing in the traditional sense of a cable television. And the, the reason why that matters is that um, we have taken the position that that is fundamentally a reproduction issue um, and that the petitioners are attempting to repackage a reproduction case that isn't very good as a public performance issue by saying that you can treat a thousand private streams as one public stream. Um, so with that background, I would say that I think that the argument went quite well. Um, we feel confident about how it went and are optimistic. It seemed like the judges, sorry, the justices were particularly focused on the implications of this case for cloud computing, which we have long said is a major concern under the petitioner's interpretation of the statute. Hi, thanks for uh, having me here. Uh, Pidgeop is a great group, and thank you, Meredith. I'm sure you did a lot of the work in organizing this. Um, so I guess I want to take a step back quickly and just give a, a, a high-level overview of how I see the case uh, in the abstract. Uh, first, I think the good news uh, from my client's perspective in the music industry is that professionally produced content is in high demand, all kinds of it in all different ways. That remains true after a long period of the internet being a big success, and so I think uh, the content industries are happy about that. The bad news that comes along with that is that people try to design business models to exploit that demand and make money off of the content that they didn't produce and they don't own. Uh, I think the even better news is that courts tend to shut those services down in the end. Uh, that's what happened in the Grokster case and many others. Um, this case is, is not about whether technology can continue to exist and provide you with access to content. It's about whether there has to be revenue sharing with the copyright owners who produce the content so that they can continue to produce it. Um, the tech sector, I think, reportedly has $550 billion in cash reserves right now, so they can afford to uh, pay for licenses when they use other people's material. Um, my impression from today's arguments is also optimistic. Uh, I agree that they were very concerned about cloud services. Um, however, I think there was very little, very little discussion of the statutory language because the justices all seemed to agree that it clearly applied to area. So then they were worried about line drawing after that. Um, so that's, that's how I see today. Well, let me, let me emphasize at the outset uh, here that I'll give you my views and my views alone and not necessarily those of my clients uh, who uh, I found quite frequently disagree with what I have to say. Um, from our perspective, uh, what Aereo is, is a commercial broadcast retransmission service. It does exactly what uh, cable systems do, exactly what uh, satellite carriers do. It picks up a broadcast, over-the-air broadcast, and then it retransmits them to paying subscribers. And uh, in, these, in my view, uh, what uh, that means is that they are required to get a license, just like cable systems have to do, and just like satellite carriers uh, have to do. Uh, the fact that they have engineered the system in a way uh, to make uh, a slightly delayed 
retransmission uh, to use multiple mini antennas in order to uh, effectuate those uh, delayed one-on-one -on -one, uh, transmissions is irrelevant under the transmit clause. The transmit clause uh, talks about uh, uh, transmitting a performance of a work uh, to the public by any means or device. And the mini antennas, the individualized recordings, are just a device for accomplishing exactly the same thing that's accomplished by cable systems and, and uh, <clears throat> uh, satellite carriers. Uh, having said that, uh, I, I, I have found it's hazardous to predict uh, the outcome of a case based upon uh, the questions at an oral argument, so many of which are just to really ask for purposes of, uh, of playing devil's uh, advocate. Um, what I will say is that, you know, from, from the outset uh, here, that uh, my view has been that uh, uh, the Second Circuit got it wrong. It misinterpreted the, uh, the transmit clause. Uh, both uh, in the original Cablevision case as well as in uh, this particular uh, case, and that the Supreme Court will uh, will uh, ultimately come to that uh, conclusion. And I don't think there was anything that occurred during oral argument today that would change my view of that. So um, I wanted to begin by by emphasizing something that Mike said, and that is that in a sense I am – I am really here under false pretenses because although my name is on a brief, it was really the project and the product of the wonderful students of the Glushko Samuelson IP Law Clinic who unfortunately under Supreme Court rules cannot be acknowledged by name, but we know who they are and so will the clerk of the Supreme Court. And it was also very much the product of the, the, the intelligence and, and guidance of, of our, our wonderful client contact, Mark Cooper, of Consumer Federation of America, who is here today and I hope may have something to say later on, and who really is from the, at least from the standpoint of clinical pedagogy, just about the world's best client. So thank you very much, Mark. Um, so I'm, a, I'm, I'm here under false pretenses, and the main insight I'm going to offer you is a non-original one, which is that, and I, I owe it to, to Bob Schwartz, who, who offered it to me on the steps of the Supreme Court this morning, and it was simply too good not to steal. And that is that what was quite remarkable to me listening in the courtroom today was the extent to which the questioning dealt in issues of analogies. There was a surprising difficulty or, or unwillingness or restraint on the part of the court to ask the, the hard questions about what Aereo actually is. And there were many questions, starting with Justice Sotomayor opening up asking, well, isn't it really cable? that were directed to the issue of what it is like. And that, of course, gave me some, some hope for an outcome in that the, the, the theme, the argument that runs through the brief that our clinic submitted on behalf of CFA and Consumers Union in this case is that what it's really like is the activities, the long sanctioned and, and widely accepted activities of home video recording using purchased or rented personal equipment. And that it is also like a whole series of other gradual or incremental developments over time which have had the effect of shifting more authority, more choice, more sovereignty over content use into the hands of consumers, which obviously is, as consumer advocates, we think is a good thing. So um, I will hazard a, a guess, and that is that this case is likely to be decided, at least in part, on the basis of which of the various analogies that were proposed today and discussed today, some in considerable length and at considerable depth, is finally the one that captures the imagination of the court. And I don't, I didn't see a clear signal 
about that. The other thing that was obvious, and, and my colleagues have said it, but it is worth reiterating, is that to a degree quite unexpected by me, perhaps not unexpected by others, these issues around the fate of cloud computing and the implications of the decision for cloud computing were very, very much in the minds of many of the justices. So um, the, even though the issue, as it's been framed for us, is a very narrow issue of statutory construction, it seemed clear to me in the light of this case, not, not so much, and here I, I beg to differ a little with Matt, that the court was all satisfied and settled on the issue of statutory construction, but rather that the tack taken on the issue of statutory construction is going to depend in the end on, on which of the analogies, which of the metaphors, which of the similes, I can never remember which of those is which. My junior high school English teacher explained it to me, but I've forgotten and have never bothered to remember since. Um, and that it, that it is that, in fact, that is likely to drive the statutory construction. So I should add a uh, measure of full disclosure here that uh, I am, uh, while I'm at EFF, and this uh, issue was of great interest to, to, to EFF and the partner organizations with whom we filed uh, an amicus brief, uh, I was um, uh, previously at Constantine Cannon and uh, was, was uh, uh, engaged in uh, uh, counseling uh, Aereo bef before it was Aereo, or even before it was Bamboom, when it was sort of uh, uh, Chet Kenogio's great idea. Uh, so uh, it's an issue that I've personally been, been involved with for, uh, I guess, four years now. Um, our point, and, and I guess this uh, will differ a little bit from uh, from what Peter said, but the the, the uh, point that we made was the court is not particularly good at prognostication about the, the future of industries and markets and technologies, especially when it's ruling in the in the copyright context and that it should avoid doing that and simply choose the interpretation of the statute that's the most internally consistent, that gives effect to every word, that, uh, that, that, that makes internal sense, which in a sense is I think what the Second Circuit did in the Aereo case. Uh, you know, it is, it is an interpretation that works and that doesn't require the court to to, to, to be a, a, a prognosticator of technology policy. Um, oddly enough, that's not how the, that is, although I'm sure they read my brief, that is, that's not how the argument proceeded today. They, they didn't really touch on the, 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 the textual interpretation at all. Um, not, I think, because it was irrelevant to them. I'm sure it will be, but well, frankly, I don't know the reason, but the, um, put this, the, um, I think they, I think they might come around to that, but I, I was, was, the, the points that were brought up in the, uh, argument today, you know, they suggested more of a, po more of a policy focused approach, you know, is this good for the industry? Is this, going to hurt cloud computing? Is this going to hurt television? Um, but I don't know that that's where the, they will land. And I don't know ultimately that, that, that that's what will, I, I, it seems like that's what will guide the, the, the textual uh, interpretation. But, but not necessarily because there were so many, because there were so many, they, they were being pulled in so many directions by those metaphors. Uh, yeah, it could be yet yeah, that they will, that they'll return to a, a kind of a strictly textualist approach. I, mean, I, I suppose it's, it is possible that uh, the Justice Scalia will, will take the reins, and, and uh, then I expect that's what we'll see. So let me, it, one of the things is in the press, and certainly in the Washington Post, this story was about how Aereo is going to kill television as we know it, and that's pretty heated rhetoric. Which, which one would have expected when the justices are thinking about the consequences of their decision to have made it into the conversation today, but, but it didn't. 
um, it didn't feature, a, and maybe that's because it's assumed that there's harm to the broadcasters, or maybe the fear about the future of cloud computing just dominated their thinking. But, but I guess I want to ask a provocative question that I hope Bob will feel provoked <laughs> to reply to, which is, you know, why isn't this just a good news story all around? Why do we have a case? Why isn't this win, win, win? Aereo is, 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 is getting, is enlarging the audience for br live broadcast television by allowing consumers who are out and about with their mobile devices to watch programming that they wouldn't otherwise watching. That programming is supported at least in part by advertising revenues. The larger the audience, the more the ad revenues once Nielsen gets its metrics in place to measure this audience. And therefore, isn't this a win, win, win? We've grown the pie. Um, and and Aereo gets to keep its its fee for its added value of its service, and then the content owners and the broadcasters divvy up the extra ad revenue. So why isn't that the answer here? And well, I, I don't know if this is provocative of a response here or not, but uh, <clears throat> what you say, Mike, is, is not unreasonable, uh, and it is exactly the same kind of argument uh, that uh, Cable made. Uh, 40 years ago in connection with uh, the Copyright Act of 1976. Now, they also argued that this is a good news story. We are cable operators. We're taking these signals and making them available to people who, because of poor reception problems or whatever, are not going to be able to see it. And you, uh, as the broadcasters uh, and you, the copyright owners, will have more eyeballs. Congress understood that argument, and Congress decided that, no, you should get a license. If you're going to be a commercial service that makes money uh, off of, 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 of retransmitting another's copyrighted programming, you need licenses to do that. And Congress was the one that rewrote the statute, rewrote the public performance uh, definition and the transmit clause to make clear that you would have to do that. Uh, and, and so I think, you know, the answer is that this is a series of, of, of counterbalancing considerations that, you know, Congress has already taken into account, and the bottom line is, is that uh, they came to the conclusion that a license is, is necessary. Okay. Um, well, Caitlin, I bet you might have a few things you might want to say, so why don't you go ahead and add. Um, right. So one thing that I think is not immediately apparent from reading the broadcaster's brief is who pays copyright royalties to do what Aereo does, to provide consumers access to local broadcast television. The answer is nobody, full stop. Cable systems do not pay to do that. Satellite systems do not pay to do that. Antenna manufacturers don't pay to do that. There's nobody in the world besides Aereo of whom the broadcasters have ever demanded copyright royalties for retransmission of local broadcast content. So it's, you know, you can say you need to get a license, but the key thing that's missing from that explanation is the fact that the licenses that are compulsory licenses for both cable and satellite systems are royalty free. The systems don't have to pay for that. So we think that it's fundamentally unfair for Aereo to have to pay what nobody else does. Can I, can I add? <laughs> yeah, you know, because, because, because I think that's, that, right, that's great. Mitch, Mitch and then Bob. Yeah, um, the word retransmit does not appear in the uh, in Section 106, the exclusive rights of the copyright owner, or in the definitions in, in uh, Section 101. I know it appears uh, to, to a degree in, in the uh, uh, cable and satellite statutory licenses, but retransmission is a, is a communications law concept. Um, and so to suggest that uh, retransmission in, in all instances requires a copyright license is to say that only FCC licensed entities that, that are using particular technologies uh, and, and under particular uh, sort of regulatory frameworks can transmit video to the public. Uh, and that's you know that has kind of staggering implications for you know for for, for innovation if if if, if uh, it essentially gives a monopoly to cable and satellite. Uh, yeah, a, co a couple of things. Uh, well, the, uh, Mitch is right. The statute does the Copyright Act does not use the term uh, retransmission. It does use the term secondary transmission, which has essentially the same meaning. But 
Uh, going back to Caitlin's point here about um, uh, a payment of, of royalties for retransmitting local signals, um, one of the things that uh, it was actually, actually Justice Scalia who pointed it out uh, at the oral argument today, and I, and I think really shouldn't be lost about this, this case here, is that uh, it's not simply ab about uh, taking a New York signal and making it available to, uh, to a New York residence or a DC broadcast signal and making it available to uh, DC residents via, via the Internet. Uh, the interpretation of the Copyright Act that Aereo and its amici advance here uh, is one that applies regardless of whether you're taking New York signals and making them available in New York or taking New York signals and making them available in Los Angeles or, or in Sydney, Australia, for that matter. Uh, their interpretation of, of the law is that as long as they use these mini antennas, capture the signals uh, through mini antennas, uh, and then insert this, uh, this um, uh, DVR, a separate DVR for each subscriber, uh, there is no public performance. And so what that means is that uh, they can take these signals and send them anywhere in, in the world. And, and that is not a business model they have now, but that is the business model that uh, their, uh, their theory uh, would support. And they certainly haven't disavowed the notion that at some point in time they wouldn't do that. And this goes back to a point that I think also particularly concerned uh, my clients, uh, uh, the National Football League and Major League Baseball here. Uh, you take somebody like the National Football League that has offered a, a product uh, in the marketplace, a very successful product called Sunday Ticket, uh, where they take broadcasts uh, of, of NFL games on, on Sunday and they make it available to subscribers all around the country. They do it over direct TV, or if you're a direct TV subscriber, you can get it over, over the Internet. Uh, that package is, is a very important package for uh, the NFL uh, to offer. Uh, under Aereo's uh, theory here, they could pick up uh, eight broadcast signals around the country, and they could replicate that package without paying the NFL, without paying the broadcasters uh, anything uh, uh, for that. And that is uh, a matter that's also of great concern. Uh, you can do the same thing with Major League Baseball telecasts that are on broadcast uh, uh, television. Uh, and, and finally, to, just to go back to the point that, um, uh, that uh, Justice Scalia made today, uh, the argument, that the interpretation that Aereo offers uh, of uh, the, uh, the transmit clause here is not limited to just take broadcast signals. They can do the same thing with HBO or ESPN. Uh, if they receive that signal uh, and, uh, uh, with, and, and use the mini antennas, use the individualized DVRs, they can retransmit those signals as well and claim that is not a public performance. I think, frankly, there are other provisions that they would violate by doing that. Uh, but uh, that is their theory. It's not just limited broadcast. It's just that broadcast signals happen to be you know, freely available. I was interested today that when Mr. Frederick was was confronted with the question that that you describe, he answered, as I understood, and perhaps I understood poorly and should be corrected, that the question of whether or not the rationale behind Aereo would apply to distant signals as distinct from local signals or to cable signals rather than broadcast signals would necessarily be resolved if it arose under the rubric of fair use, that the question, in other words, would be to what extent the rationale of the Sony decision, which applies the fair use doctrine to consumer capture of local broadcast signals, might be fairly and reasonably expanded to distant signals and cable signals. Is that a fair, Caitlin, a fair description of, of, of what his answer was? So I think that um I think the general thrust of the argument was that the reproduction and public performance rights are complementary rights. So generally speaking, there are multiple ways that a work can get to the public. You can take one copy and you can broadcast a performance from that copy to multiple people. That's a public performance issue. Or you can make an individual user-specific copy for each user who wants it and then create a private performance from that copy. Um, Aereo system does the latter, so we've said that that should be analyzed under reproduction principles. 
Um, if you, if instead of taking local broadcast content um, area, we're taking HBO, for instance, the reason that that would raise a different question is that this is a public performance case, but we still have a reproduction case coming. So we basically say, analyze it under the right right. Um, and when you're talking about local broadcast signals, the reason that the, that the reproduction claim doesn't go very far is because the Supreme Court has said in Sony that consumers have a right to make a personal recording of local over-the-air broadcast television. Um, there is no reason to presume that that would be the same result if we were talking about content that wasn't freely made available to the public over the public airwaves. And this is what interests me, uh, sort of from, from an academic standpoint, about the case, and that is that it seems to me that there really is now, before the court, a, a collision between two very, very well-established uh, traditions of jurisprudence and legislation. On the one hand, as, as we've seen, the notion as expressed in Section 111, and then again in the satellite provisions, that what we would define as a cable system ought to pay for the privilege of doing what it does. And on the other hand, this extremely strong fair use tradition applied to the, the individual technologically enabled capture of local broadcast signals. And it isn't easy. I think something has to give in this decision. And it isn't clear to me which of those traditions is going to be the one that, that finally dominates the thinking of the court. But potentially, I think this is a case of great importance precisely because it does appear to present this kind of internal jurisprudential conflict which, is, which requires resolution. It could, of course, simply be booted to Congress, as, as has been done in the past. But I'm not persuaded that this court will do that. Go ahead, just a quick response to that. I mean, I understand why area supporters want to focus on the reproduction right and on Sony and on uh, that line uh, of precedent because uh, the transmit clause is so clear and so broad that they don't want this to be about that portion of the statute. Um, but even the Second Circuit in Cablevision uh, withheld judgment on whether uh, the so-called volitional conduct requirement that's applicable, according to some courts, to the reproduction right uh, applies to the public performance right context because that portion of the statute is so broadly written precisely because Congress wanted to make sure it covered every new type of technology that gained the, the effective benefits uh, that cable does, but not only cable, video on demand and other types of services. So I don't see this as a necessary collision. There's one provision that's quite broad and clearly applies, and there's another provision where we could debate if there's a violation of the reproduction right or not. Uh, that's how I see the statute breaking down. Well, let, let's talk about that breadth question, because um, uh, so, so the justices, were precisely because there is a breadth in the, in the language, any you know, whether the device is, is this, any device and in the same place or at different places, same time or different times, it's still to the public. Um, and in fact, the Second Circuit in Cablevision and then again in Aereo essentially imposed, uh, decided that the relevant transmission has to be the transmission from a particular copy because otherwise it couldn't conceive of what a private performance would be. Um, if the audience is any audience that's capable of receiving the work of authorship. Um, and, and, and that seemed to be troubling. Certainly Justices Breyer and Justice Sotomayor were looking for a way to write this that, um, that would keep certain, at least standard sort of cloud blocker ser services like Dropbox legal. And their concern is that the broad interpretation would mean that any time you upload a file and then stream it back to yourself, you're engaging in a public performance and violating copyright. And, and uh, Mr. Clement it appeared to offer a way around that particular scenario by saying if the content was uploaded by the consumer and then streamed back to them, that that would be a private performance. And distinguishing Aereo because the 
the, the content is coming in from the broadcast signal rather than an upload. Um, but at least Justice Kagan uh, had some qualms about that and was worried about, uh, you know, the Dropbox is not just up and back to one. It can be up and shared. What happens then? Is that a public performance? Um, and I want to, I'm not sure that the justices felt like they got the answer they wanted to that question. So I'd offer to the panel to sort of help the, <laughs> help wrestle with that one. If I could. Um, on the breadth question, I mean, I think it's, un it's unquestionable that the right of public performance is technology neutral. That's as clear as day in the statute. But there's no basis for saying that the, what I would call the freedom uh, to make non-public transmissions is not also technology neutral. In other words, that, that it could similarly grow with, with time and technology from um, a, the, the wire from the roof to the living room to a personal private transmission over the internet. Anyone else want to? Well, I, I would just jump in to, to follow up on what you said about Mr. Clement's very, um, I think, very well considered answer to that question, namely, well, the cloud is in no trouble as long as the things that are stored in the cloud originate with the same person who placed them in the cloud. Trouble is, we at some level we all understand, even from our own sort of in, in my, my own case or my own primitive fumblings in the area of cloud computing, that that's not always the case. But I actually think the difficulty with that answer is otherwise. What makes the cloud content that has been uploaded by the same person who is about to download it different in kind or character? And I think the answer is. It is obviously legitimate. The person who has put their own content on the cloud has authorized its presence there and, in effect, has licensed himself or herself to retrieve it. What could be more simple? So it is, in a sense, the implicit legitimacy of that transaction on both its up and down legs that makes it the easy case. It also makes a service like Vimeo, where where A uploads for the specific use and benefit of B, relatively transparent. The difficulty, of course, is that, and this takes me back, I'm afraid, to the theme of the, the, the Sony theme, as I see it operating and saw it, or thought I heard it operating in the, in the argument, and that is that the capture of over-the-air local broadcast content for the use of an individual is also an entirely legitimate activity, as legitimate as the Vimeo user's decision to authorize their, their business associate to view the material that they have uploaded themselves. So it isn't clear if legitimacy is going to be the key to understanding the aspects of cloud computing that are unaffected or would be unaffected by such a decision, it isn't clear to me why the activities of area users don't at least notionally fall on the legitimate rather than the illegitimate side of cloud computing use. I don't know if that's clear, but I'm, I'm struggling with the idea. Just to follow on that, I, I actually agree with Peter that um, when Justice Kagan was ask, asking those questions, I haven't had a chance to go back through the transcript fully, but what I uh, was hit with in the room was that what she was describing, a, a type of service where uh, many users can upload content and share it with each other, and there might be or might not be a, a, some type of curation by the service provider, that does describe Vimeo or YouTube, and of course they need public performance licenses. Um, they, they have public performance licenses. And I think the danger with any, um, any avenue of argument uh, based on this cloud computing analogy is that any, any construct you come up with to torture the language of the statute into not applying to the various services that you might or might not think are legitimate 
um, ends up exempting a whole broad swath of services that clearly should have licenses for public performances. And so I think the simpler answer, um, although it's, it's not uh, an easy one to give, is that clearly the transmit clause does apply to uh, a wide variety of, of types of services that could be described as cloud services. And, and exactly where to draw the line did seem to me to be what the justices were concerned with. But I, I, my own personal view um, is that if they can't figure out where to put that line, they should look at the language Congress provided, apply it the way it was intended, which is quite broadly, and then leave it up to Congress to exempt any services that, uh, that may be legitimate uh, in, in the current uh, environment. And I would say that there are already some provisions designed to help deal with that problem, including Section 512, uh, the DMCA provisions with notice and takedown, which cloud services can rely on in some circumstances. So wait, uh, can I just understand the implication of that argument? So um, a, a hypothetical. We have a couple in a romantic relationship. They're in a long distance situation. Um, and person A um, uh, records a, a, a version of a song, a romantic song, uh, uploads it to a cloud service, Dropbox, Vimeo, uh, and makes that link available only to their partner. Uh, it's not available to the, it's not on the open web, it's not indexable, it's not searchable, uh, and says, here, you know, it's Valentine's Day, open this. And so then the, the partner B clicks the link and streams this, the, this version of the music. Is that a public performance on your view? This is a recording of a song that the individual who uploaded it doesn't own the copyright. To. That's correct. Um, so there's, I think, Two approaches to it, um, but my approach would be, yes, if it's uploaded to the open internet and multiple people are able to. Uh, you're uh, fighting the hypo. <laughs> In my class, no, you can't fight the hypo. The hypo is that this link is only available to person B. No one else can. No one else can stream, stream download it. Uh, so various questions could could come up. Uh, but my, my answer would be yes, that service, arguably under the transmit clause, is publicly performing. As you know, in these cases, a lot of the details tend to get involved and your hypo might not be fully complete. But uh, I think yes. I think it's good to consider the full implications of that position, which, which would be to create uh, at least the possibility of uh, six-figure statutory damages per work for uh, many uh, services in which uh, uh, probably uh, hundreds of millions of dollars have been invested over, over the past five years. Uh, that is the world that would place us in. So if, if I could just speak to that. Um, public performance licensing for music works pretty well. There are, are performing rights organizations that provide blanket licenses to cover uh, huge catalogs of copyrighted songs. Uh, so these licenses can be obtained quite easily. As you say, there are hundreds of millions, billions of dollars being invested in these, these services. So uh, to the extent that they do engage in public performances, they can afford to acquire a license. I would also say again that, as we've seen in numerous cases, Section 512 can come up when, when appropriate. I don't want to vary the, uh, the hypothetical here. I, you know, my, my understanding of the arguments that have been made uh, by, by the various parties is that if one person transmits a performance of a work to one person, nobody is claiming that that is a public a performance. The transmit clause talks about transmitting a performance of a work to the public. If you are transmitting to just one person, uh, I don't think that, that uh, is anybody has claimed is, is, is going to be a public performance. So what, that, what, sorry, right. didn't you? No, but what I, what I think the hypothetical does, does, does illustrate here is really the problem we have in dealing with these uh, cloud computing services. And that is, is that there's a wide variety of cloud uh, uh, computing services. There's a wide variety of services that engage in, in cloud computing functionality. Uh, and uh, some of them, yes, do require public performance licenses for what they do, and others probably don't. Uh, but it's difficult to, to sit there and come up with one rule to, to encompass 
uh, an entire uh, industry that uh, is engaging in such a disparate type of activity. The one thing that, at least in my own mind, I'm clear about is that a service that retransmits broadcasts of television programming to multiple subscribers for a fee uh, is one that uh, is engaged in public performance and uh, does require uh, pro copyright licenses for those. If I could just quickly speak to the one, one thing there. Uh, I think at issue in, in part of, of, of Bob's answer is that uh, the question is who there is engaging in the transmission. And I would agree that when an individual is the one uh, responsible for the transmission to another individual and their family, that's not a public performance. But if you're uh, involved in, in transmitting things from your servers to the public, and multiple people could all be experiencing that song at, at different times, that comes within the transmit clause. So I think that this discussion really highlights something that the justices were getting at with their questions today, which is that it's very difficult to see how you can hold Aereo liable without um, rendering illegal a wide variety of cloud computing companies, all cloud computing companies, really. Um, and the petitioners and the government advanced a number of ways to distinguish Aereo from other cloud computing companies. They said that um, if a user has earlier lawful access to the work, then it's going to be a private performance. Um, if the cloud company isn't providing access to the work, then it's going to be a private performance. Um, the problem with these arguments is that they are in no way linked to the text of the statute. So they are bright lines, but you know, the company's name is not Aereo is also a bright line, and it's about as useful in terms of distinguishing under the text of the statute. So we're going to continue the conversation, but I want to invite members of the audience to, to join us. We have two microphones here. I'd ask that you use the microphone and be aware that we are recording. This is live webcast and being recorded, so please uh, you're consenting to our recording by asking a question, and uh, please identify yourself uh, 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 before g going on. And it seems like Marcus is well, uh, taking the Well, since Peter rest. invited me, I, uh, I figured I would jump up. And uh, so I'm Mark Hoop with the Consumer Federation, um, and I'm going to try and do some pedagogy, since he mentioned that. Uh, and it, it, it's really fascinating to me. One instant observation. It won't take Aereo 30 seconds to acquire the signal, run it through the antenna, so it's individually acquired, and then run it up back to the cloud. In which case, we've solved this question of how was it acquired? It was acquired individually. And that's just a chip change. It, and, and, and frankly, it just underscores how difficult that, that line is going to be. And they may actually do it that way. They may have thought of it. It's inefficient which has always been the problem with that, but they can do it in the blink of an eye. So there's no doubt that I originally acquired it and put it there. The chips will come off the line so fast your head will spin if that's the line they draw. But I want to take an interesting, the more interesting thing to me in the pedagogical point. We heard a lot about what people could do. They could do this, they could do that, they could do the other thing. Aereo didn't do any of that stuff. And Peter and I started down this path on Grokster. And I submit that the public, the Consumer Federation of America, won Grokster, hands down, but Grokster lost it. Because they were a plaintiff with dirty hands. And we have spent a long time looking for a plaintiff with clean hands. And so here's a plaintiff who tried really hard to stay within the confines of the statute, right? It's an individual. I actually pay for that content exactly the way I pay for it if I don't use area. Because how do I pay the, for the royalties of production? I watch advertising. And that's all you get when you do a broadcast television. That's all you're entitled to under the deal we made about broadcasting. And I pay that same price. I'm not Dish who gives you a, an ad, ad skipper. You have to watch the damn advertising. <laughs> and so they really did bend over backwards to not violate the law, which makes it so hard. 
And if I listen to all this, and I wasn't in the court, but I've heard the we, if if those justices are so concerned about the technology principle, the Sony principle, as they were in Grokster, the answer is, just for the fun of it, Aereo is going to win five to four, which is exactly the vote that Sony won. Why? Because the concern about the cloud computing, the technology, and the clean hands. Sony was not profiting in any way from the viewing of those uh, signals. They did not interfere. And so that's my guess, because the technology principle is supreme, and the plaintiff's hands are awfully clean in this case. Question mark? Um, does anyone know? <laughs> I, just, I just heard so many. They could have done this and they could have done that. But they didn't. And the next client paid service that comes in and does what you say, they're going to lose hands down. But the, the, this service really tried to, to, to not violate your rights. Now, you don't have to put your programs over the air. You can say, I'm only going to do it on, on cable. Different set of rights, but once you put them in the air, now you've got a different set of rights and obligations on both sides. Point of clarification, Aereo charges three ninety nine per month, so they do get paid. Oh, absolutely, for the, for the service they deliver, which is the storage, the keys, et cetera. But the consumer pays the same price to watch that football. you got to watch all those things. So, Mark, <laughs> there was an interesting flip, I thought, on the point that you're making in the argument today, and we heard it particularly from the Chief Justice, although from several others as well, and that is questions that pressed on the notion that somehow the, the technological design of Aereo was itself simply a, a, a hack of a, a disingenuous workaround. In effect, questions that seem to be attempting to turn the clean hands issue back against Aereo. And I was, I was very curious to know what other panelists thought about that line of questioning and its possible significance in the, in the outcome of the case. Because I was actually, I was, I was surprised that it, it had the prominence that it did in the argument. I've personally found it very hard to tell what effect that had on the, ju the justices. The, it, it was it was brought up, and um, I, 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 I suppose the, the answer the answer came out, and, and it was you know actually I think I think the chief justice said it. he said well um, that's he said it was a little aside he said. That's, that's not necessarily illegal. In fact, that's the sort of thing lawyers do all the time, and he got a laugh. Uh, that's what innovators do all the time. That's what, that's what exactly. innovators do. Exactly. And that's right. The Internet is a hack against AT&T Central right. Telecommunications Network. It, it, got, it, got, it got a laugh, but it wasn't clear whether it changed the other justices' minds on that point. I, I would say that part of what was going on there uh, was that the Cablevision decision, there was a cert petition which was denied, and at the time, a lot of people said, the next thing is going to come and we're going to be back here arguing the same issue again. And that's exactly what happened. And I think maybe the justices are concerned uh, that interpretations of the statute that lend themselves to all kinds of uh, strange uh, business models uh, to extract value from content uh, it can't be what Congress really wanted. Um, so that, that was my take, but it, it was kind of hard to read. But how many business models have looked really strange to us when they started? <laughs> um, especially when, when at, at their initiation, they were constrained by a regulatory environment or by a statutory environment that didn't make business sense, but, but that was, gave them enough opening to, to prove their worth in the market. Um, that's not just Aereo. That was that was FM radio, uh, which which at the time was why do we need that? We have perfectly good radio technology. That's a that's a that's that's a Rube Goldberg invention. Uh, there are other examples too. Yeah, I'm not I'm not sure what to make of, of all that. 
because I, I sort of come back to the fact that uh, Congress, when it enacted the 1976 uh, Copyright Act, uh, made a determination that commercial retransmission, broadcast retransmission services need licenses. That was the fundamental policy judgment that Congress made. And when it made that judgment, it took into account all the arguments you made a few moments ago about oh, you know, nobody has to put their programming on broadcast television. If they do, they have advertising. Congress understood that. They recognized that, but they said, if you are a third-party commercial broadcast retransmission service, you must get a license. And I, I think from the standpoint of, of many of the content owners, what difference does it make that, uh, that uh, you're a cable system that uses one antenna or an aerial that uses thousands of antennas, when only one is necessary? In either case, you are still that commercial broadcast retransmission service. You're profiting off the use of someone else's programming, and you ought to get a license. So the idea that Congress considered and rejected these arguments is strange to me, because when Congress enacted a royalty-free license to do what Aereo does, it said in the legislative history um, that the reason that no royalty payment was necessary was that the copyright holder contracted with the broadcaster on the understanding that his programming would reach the entire public by virtue of the broadcast, and therefore he wasn't injured when there was a retransmission of that content to the same audience. Let, let me just make one thing uh, clear about the Section 111 license, and that is that it is not a royalty-free license. All cable systems pay to retransmit broadcast programming, even if they carry only local signals. Every cable system pays something under the statute. And the sentence after that in legislative history says, this is not a payment for local rebroadcasts. This is an administrative fee. It's not an administrative fee. What, what it actually says is that you are paying for the privilege of being able to retransmit distant broadcast programming which is exactly the privilege that, that Aereo would have under its theory of, uh, of, of the transmit clauses. As I said, uh, you, you may be right, Mark, that uh, they don't take distant signals now, but there are a lot of cable systems now that don't retransmit uh, distant signals, but yet they still pay. They still have to get a license, and they have to pay royalties. And I should also make clear, it's not just a matter of paying the royalty fee that is specified in Section 111. It's complying with all the other conditions that the statute lays out, which includes, among other things, being regulated by the FCC, something that Aereo does not, is not uh, re regulated by. Um, we'll stop there. I knew we were going to get into Section 111 at some point, um, but we have a question. Uh, Thank you. I found, I found that exchange a little too, too stimulating. My name is John Mitchell, and uh, I, I authored uh, a brief on behalf of the American Cable Association. Uh, but one of the things I didn't touch on in the brief and alluded to, but maybe now, now I wish maybe I'd raised it, um, I had to remind my clients that the plaintiffs were not broadcasters as such. They were copyright owners. Uh, cable companies were very used to dealing with broadcasters as broadcasters and understood very well retransmission consent. Um, but uh, they always paid the broadcaster. And the broadcaster didn't necessarily own the copyright in what was being broadcast. Commercials, uh, movies from Hollywood, whatever it was, they got permission to broadcast that and yes, they did provide original programming sometimes in which they owned the copyright. And the difficulty I come across here is, well, it was pretty clear, I think, to me in the legislative history that retransmission had nothing to do with the Copyright Act. It had everything to do with, now that we had cable companies, now that Fort Knox has said you can do this, Congress was saying, well, we want to make sure that our local broadcasting community stays vibrant and doesn't just become a wasteland for people who don't have anybody else willing to pay for their signal. So they created not just the retransmission consent portion where cable companies pay to retransmit the broadcast signal, but they also have this flip side, which was the must carry, where you can have a little broadcaster out there who may or may not own copyrights and everything that's being broadcast, who can force the cable company to retransmit this, which raises my sort of double barrel question. 
if I'm the broadcaster, and let's forget the retransmission consent where, where I can force a negotiation with the cable company to pay, to pay me as a broadcaster, forget whether they pay the copyright owner or not, they pay me as the broadcaster. Instead of that, I can say, you have to carry me because we're under a certain threshold of you've got to have one third or whatever it is uh, of your channels have to be made available. I happen to be broadcasting on channel two. You have to assign that channel to me by law. You have to carry it, whether you like it or not, whether you think it's a waste of your time, whether you think it's a net loss to you, you are obligated by law to carry that. Now we have the situation of, it would seem to me if the broadcaster owns the copyright in what is being under the, the, the must-carry rule being retransmitted, we in effect have the only provision of the Copyright Act in which the copyright owner has the right to do or to authorize or to obligate someone else to publicly perform the work. I, there, there's, you know, I can't obligate anybody to recite my poetry in public, but unless it was broadcast. <laughs> now, now the broadcaster gets to do that. But if they don't own the copyright, then they have an exclusive right in derogation of the right of the copyright owner, it would seem. So whether the copyright owner in their original programming consents or not, they have a right to obligate the cable company without paying a dime to retransmit it. And I just wanted to see if the panelists have any take on that. It didn't seem to really surface much in the briefs, but it just seems like that's what we're left with when we look at the must carry provisions of the Communications Act as opposed to exclusively the payment part. I know everybody likes to follow the money, but there is a huge chunk there that says you get to force cable companies to carry your free over the air broadcast whether they want to or not, regardless whether you own the copyright and the works being broadcast. Any takers? <laughs> <laughs> Question well, mark. I, I, yeah. I'm mindful of your earlier admonition about not wanting to take us too far down. Or just explain it as we go. <laughs> so uh, let, me, let me just try with a little bit of background here. And that is that uh, there really are two laws here that uh, are, are being referenced. One is the Copyright Act. The other is the Communications Act. Uh, in the Copyright Act, uh, uh, copyright owners are given a bundle of exclusive rights in Section 106 of the Act, one of which is the right to publicly uh, perform. And that uh, definition of publicly perform uh, comes in the, the transmit clause. Uh, the Communications Act uh, says that uh, multi-channel video programming distributors, or MVPDs, uh, must get the consent of the broadcast station before retransmitting the signal of that broadcast station, except under certain circumstances, you know, one of which is mentioned that, that they opt instead for must carry as opposed to uh, re retransmission consent. The Copyright Act affords rights to the content owner in the programming of the works that the content owner has created. The Communications Act affords rights to the broadcaster for the signal that the broadcaster has, has, has put together. They're two separate uh, provisions of, of, of the law. I think uh, when we when talking about must carry, it's really not involved uh, in, um, our, uh, in, in the Aereo case here. What they're dealing with in the Aereo case uh, is the copyright law and simply whether or not the transmit clause covers this particular type of activity. They're also not really dealing with trans retransmission consent under Section 2. That's not an issue uh, in the, uh, the case. Uh, the issue is simply one under, under copyright law. So I, I understand the concerns that, that, uh, that, that you raise here, but I don't think they're part of this case. I hope that helps. But, but can I ask a question about, and please, if there are others, who want to, please come up to the mic. I'm just going to keep us going for a minute. But, but can I ask about consequences here? Um, um, so, so I guess uh, in terms of if Aereo wins, is it the end of television as we know it? If not, why not? Um, and, and conversely, if Aereo loses, um, we were told that Aereo would be able to get licenses to the content. But part of Congress's rationale for creating compulsory licenses in Section 111 and Section 119, 122 is rec a recognition of the multiple copyrights that are out there, uh, copyrights in advertising, copyrights in content, and aggregating all those copyrights could be cost prohibitive. So what, 
when, you know, and, and some of the justices clearly seem to want a compulsory license solution, but don't feel like they have the authority to, to reach that solution. Um, at least Justice Breyer and Justice Sotomayor seem to want to find a way to that end point um, uh, in their questions. So I, if you, it's a double-barreled question because it's asking on, on both sides, but can we just talk a little bit about the consequences as the justices weigh these? Because I'm sure from the questioning that is at the forefront of their minds. And why don't we just run down the table? Um, so on the first question of what the consequences for the broadcasters will be, I think that the broadcasters' public statements are perhaps the best indication. Um, and six weeks ago, Les Moonves, the CEO of CBS, uh, announced to investors that if Aereo wins this case, the company won't be impacted at all. Um, so I think that that is more revelatory than what they say in their briefs here. Um, the question of why the broadcasters, why, why a license is not an adequate solution is an interesting one because, as Mark says, um, Aereo expands the audience for broadcast television and broadcasters are paid by advertisers for that. So you might think, why wouldn't they want to license that technology? Um, and the answer is that the broadcasters have announced that they are developing a system that will let you get broadcast television on your mobile device. But you have to buy a special device and you have to pay a monthly fee to your cable system to get it. So they want to be able to double dip. Aereo doesn't allow them to do that, so they're trying to run Aereo out of the market. Uh, I, I don't think that uh the end of television as we know it is, is coming either way. There's going to be significant harm uh, if Aereo wins. I agree with you that some justices seem to think that the transmit clause covers Aereo and nevertheless were troubled, troubled by that and wanted to be able to create a compulsory license. I also agree with you that they don't think they can do that themselves and that the proper body to do that would be Congress uh, if and when they decide that that's in the public interest. It you know, may be helpful to think of this uh, case in, in the broader historical uh, context. And that is, this really is deja vu all over again. Uh, you can go back uh, 90 years ago uh, when radio stations uh, made the argument that uh, they were not uh, engaging in public performances. They were simply allowing individuals to enjoy in the privacy of his or her own home uh, the copyrighted works of, of others, in that case, largely music. Uh, and the courts rejected that, uh, 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 or at least the Sixth Circuit did uh, back in 1925. Uh, cable came along uh, several years uh, later, and they also argued that, that we're not engaging in public performance, not just that they're not performing, which was the narrow issue decided by the Supreme Court in Sony and Teleprompter, but rather we're not publicly uh, performing. Uh, and uh, the Second Circuit, at least, uh, rejected that. The Second uh, Supreme Court then uh, reversed on the grounds of, of, of performance. Uh, and what ultimately happened is Congress uh, uh, rejected the teleprompter and fortnightly decisions, uh, required cable systems to get a license, and then gave them a, a compulsory license. Uh, fast forward uh, about another 15, 20 years, and satellite uh, came on. Uh, and satellite uh, carriers wanted to retransmit broadcast uh, uh, signals, but they too did not want to go and get licenses from individual copyright owners. And what happened? Well, the courts, they argued that they were entitled to the cable compulsory license. Uh, the Copyright Office, ultimately affirmed by the, by the courts, uh, rules uh, that, uh, that uh, no, you are not cable systems. And what happens? They go out in, to Congress and they get a compulsory license to do what they're doing today. And so when DISH Show and DirecTV retransmit broadcast programming, they're not doing it pursuant to the cable compulsory license. They're doing it pursuant to their own specially ta tailored uh, compulsory licenses that appear in Sections 119 and 122 of the Copyright Act. And then to, to now to answer your question after, after all that, and that's what will happen with uh, Internet services as well. If the Supreme Court reads the statute the way, at least I believe, it should be read the way the, the Second Circuit did not read it, uh, Ariel will be required to get uh, uh, public performance licenses, just like satellite carriers were about 25 or 30 years ago. And they'll say, well, we can't go out and negotiate with all the different copyright owners and 
and uh, they'll have to do exactly what satellite did, that is go to Congress and get a compulsory license that's uh, tailored. I'm not saying they, they should get a compulsory license, that Congress ought to give them one, or what the conditions of it will be, but that's what the road will hold uh, if the Supreme Court rules uh, in favor of the petitioners. So I, I think I, I agree with my fellow panelists that whatever is decided is not likely to be the end of television as we know it, nor perhaps even the end of Aereo as we, as we um, begin to understand it. I think the stakes are higher than that. I think that what's at risk here isn't television in all its, its dubious glory or Aereo, but a and I'll pick a number two, of a 40 or 45 year old tradition of, of, of radical and dramatic innovation in the consumer electronics sector, which will be significantly chilled by any decision that upholds the petitioner's viewpoint. I said earlier that I think there's a, a, a a really a historic conflict posed in this case between the licensing principle as we've heard it articulated and, and sourced to a variety of decisions taken in the 1970s in the court and in the legislature and the, the, the fair use principle which gave us Sony and which has given us a, a remarkable 30-year run of innovation since. And that, I think, is what is at risk. That is what may not survive, because it can't survive under the licensing model an adverse decision to area. I completely agree with Peter, but let me try to nuance it a little bit, because uh, there will be internet video, there will be video delivered to, to customers in many new ways, regardless of how this case comes out. And there will be innovations in uh, the, the consumer video experience that, that, uh, that will come, uh, even if Aereo loses, but they will come only from, uh, generally speaking, the, uh, the, the, the networks or the cable networks, uh, their affiliated companies and their preferred partners, or at least entities that are big enough to, uh, uh, to, to, to litigate or, um, or to, 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 to uh, license uh, on that scale. So the, the, the harm is really that, uh, not that innovation will stop, but the innovation will come only from those who have an incentive to avoid cannibalizing some existing legacy businesses. It will be channeled in particular directions and the sorts of things that um, could be great, they could be the next great thing, they could create a tremendous amount of value the way that most home recording technologies did, uh, but that harms Nielsen ratings or that harms uh, you know, some particular measure of value that is traditionally relied on by, by the, sort of the, the few large companies in, in this space, though that's what will be lost. I think we have one final question. Uh, go ahead, sir. Uh, my name is uh, Phil Hochberg, and I am, uh, I'm just a country lawyer. The, uh, uh, I found myself uh, very persuaded by uh, Mr. Garrett's remarks. Uh, perhaps in part because I represent the NBA and the NHL. <laughs> uh, there's just no doubt that uh, there's an interrelationship with the broadcast business. And uh, as opposed to what this gentleman up front uh, had, to, had to say, uh, there are circumstances where they don't desire uh, signals to go into certain areas. Uh, the the National Football League, when it sells uh, a telecast to a, uh, a Washington station, doesn't want the Washington station to go into into San Francisco. The Washington advertisers don't get a damn bit of of value out of uh, out of uh, their telecast going into San Francisco. A local automobile dealer doesn't derive any value whatsoever. The fact is. 
bottom line that I think you have to recognize in this case and in the whole situation that uh, there is an interrelationship with the broadcasting business. There is an interrelationship uh, with people who do not have satellite uh, receivers, who do not have cable. Some 15% uh, of the country does not is not hooked up. Uh, and there has to be a consideration of, uh, of what happens uh, with the uh, uh, with broadcasting. Do you recognize that Ariel fastidiously honored that relationship? Well, that, that and, sounds and, and like... <laughs> with all respect, that's a, rela that's a relationship. You know what? I'm, I'm going to ask that we take this into the hall. Uh, I, think, <laughs> I, I think this is... We're out of doors. This is, this is good reception. This is... Uh, let me add one point, though, about about the way this the, this evolves. Um, because if if Congress were in, interested in a compulsory license for web retransmissions, it should just be noted that the United States Trade Representative has negotiated free trade agreements on behalf of the United States, in which we've made commitments to our trading partners not to do that. That we, we would only do a re, web retransmission with the permission of the copyright owner. Now, Congress has. Uh, ignored our international obligations before, and it wouldn't, you know, under the right circumstances might do it again. But it is at least um, a, a factor that might fe feature in future negotiations on the Hill if, if we get to that stage. With that, uh, I want to invite folks to, uh, oh, and Meredith has. Uh, so we have a large 1L property review session happening in this room. They are masked outside. <laughs> so the compromise is that if you go out this door, this door over here, you will not be going upstream against worried one else. I highly recommend that door. The receptions in the student lounges, which is on the back of this side of the building. And can I ask that we thank, uh, can we thank Meredith Jacob and Katie Evans for organizing it and our panel for their presentation.